Hey, what's up, guys? It's Dan from the MMA Cast. Today, I'm joined by someone who I have the pleasure of sitting down and talking with today, Janae Harding from Bellator MMA. How are you doing today, Janae? Good, thank you. How are you, Dan? Pretty good, pretty good. Yourself? Yeah, good. Good That's today. Good. That's good. And obviously, you know, we're sitting here today because um, just like to chat and whatnot. And one of the things that I wanted to actually uh, speak with you, first of all, obviously we mentioned how you're doing. You're doing great, as you can tell. And just to kind of see first things first, uh, obviously you went through uh, eye surgery to begin with. Uh, kind of how's that? Uh, how's the recovery on that? And is there kind of like any uh, hurdles you've had to overcome since, uh, you know, obviously overcoming this obstacle? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, like new addition would be these glasses. Um, it's definitely changed everything a couple of months ago. I noticed um, something was off with my vision and um, I was over in San Diego and I decided to get it all checked out when I got back to Australia and then it turns out I needed surgery. Um, so now that I'm, I'm probably like, today is Wednesday, so I think I'm like eight weeks maybe post-surgery. Um, and that's probably like the, I've never had major surgery like in anything. I've been really lucky to um, not really have any major injuries or have to get surgery on anything. So it's probably like the first time I've gone through any sort of um, like decent injury adversity, I guess. Um, so yeah, it was a big hurdle for me. It was a lot, especially when it's your vision, it's a little bit scary. Um, not really understanding, I guess, like what the procedures are going to be and what the recovery is going to look like. Um, I think if it was like a knee or something, I would know. Like I, so I know so many people that have like torn their ACL or whatever it is. But um, but yeah, eyes was a little bit of a foreign subject to me. So um, it's all been a bit of a roller coaster. But uh, definitely super grateful to have had the surgery, have had really good medical treatment um, over the last eight weeks, and uh, hopefully enough to keep it for this um, next fight. It looks like I still I'll still be able to fight. I haven't been officially cleared yet. Um, but it looks like I'll still be able to fight. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people who need to wear glasses or have some sort of eye issues that still fight these days. So um, that sort of had me in high hopes. And then, yeah, I just am going to wait. Um, we're going to aim to fight in the next couple of months. I might be overreaching a little bit, but I'm ready to go because I took the rest of last year off. So, um, yeah, now all this stuff's been done. It's almost like the surgeons and stuff had done like a little bit of extra stuff to it to give it a little bit of extra security. Um, I now have a buckle around my eye, which is kind of like a silicon rubber band sort of around my eye. I'm just pulling the walls of my eye in so that um, my retina can kind of stay attached um, and hopefully deter it from detaching again. And then, um, yeah, and then I, I've pretty much got like 12 to 6 of laser as well. So that's an added preventative. And then I've got cryo on there too. So we're pretty much solid on this left eye now. So just hoping to fight in the next couple of months, getting my visa sorted right now um, so that I can return back to the States and then go from there. So it should be should be good. Definitely. And obviously you mentioned eye, eye injuries are no joke whatsoever. Obviously we've seen uh, you're mentioning all the necessary precautions you've needed to take in order to prevent any further damage to the left eye. But Honestly, it's actually remarkable, the the recovery, the timetable. I mean, in eight weeks, for all of this to happen, it's kind of insane to put that into perspective. I mean, we've seen uh, eye injuries before. Obviously, the most notable one is Michael Bisping in the UFC, where unfortunately, you know, he no longer has one of his eyes. But to, to see you in such high spirits and be able to kind of take all the precautions and really go at it uh, with added caution, it's something amazing to see. And obviously, uh, something I wanted to dive into is you mentioned stateside. Obviously, um... You know, how was tra you mentioned San Diego, you got the injury there, but how was San Diego as a whole? I know we were talking in the in the Instagram DMs about the beaches and Gold Coast and San Diego. How does that compare? Yeah, it's amazing. Like, um, it's kind of crazy. The end of last year, I guess, took a little bit of a turn. I had a lot of momentum. I mean, I did come off a loss, but I, w I was still actively fighting and I was excited to maybe compete a lot more last year after um, a year or so of COVID. So... I'd come back off that fight and then um, I did two weeks of hotel quarantine and then five days later we got stuck in a lockdown. And it was like, I, I think a lot of people in the US now know and a lot of my friends now know how extreme that lockdown was. Yeah. Um, we couldn't leave more than like three miles from our front door. We had to wear masks outside, carpooling was illegal. You could only, like all the gyms were closed, everything was closed, it was crazy. So I had made, yeah, a split decision to go to San Diego. I was just like, man, I can't train over here in Sydney. Um, I was kind of like out 
sort of in somewhat of a rural area away from all my coaches and stuff. So I couldn't even really organize training um, and it definitely couldn't sustain a camp. So I was like, oh, well, I might as well either do nothing over here or network and stuff and, and make some, I guess, new relationships over in San Diego and finally do this U.S. trip that I've been kind of meaning to do since the beginning of my career. Um, so, yeah, so I was lucky enough to have a lot of great, great people, specifically Alima Lee McFarlane. She made a big difference. I kind of like had met her during that trip after the fight and then obviously got back to Australia and I was like, hey, dude, like I'm really struggling over here. I'm going to come back. And so she helped me so much um, organizing things and helping me tee stuff up to make me, um, I guess, have a lot more peace of mind going over to the States. I've been over to the States so many times, but never really stayed for that prolonged amount of time. So I had aimed for three months and, and yeah, I ended up packing up my stuff, putting on my my um, like furniture and everything in storage and then uh, finishing my lease over in Sydney and uh, going to San Diego for three months. And it was honestly one of the best decisions I've made. It was um, a phenomenal experience and all the gyms and stuff are amazing. As you mentioned, Alliance, Alliance Jiu Jitsu, Alliance, however you want to say it, was definitely amazing. 10th Planet, Azteca Boxing, like everyone welcomed me in with open arms and I got to um, guest network and meet so many like, not only like people that I'll know, but uh, just lifelong friends too. I was like so stoked to have um, lived that lifestyle. Like you said, beaches, man. Like it's basically like the Gold Coast, but over mm-hmm. in California. So I was I was at home being a Gold Coast girl and having grown up here on the Gold Coast. I was just so lucky to live that beach lifestyle, train and, and network with so many great people and meet so many tra- great training partners and coaches. Definitely, and I love that you mentioned, uh, obviously, the beaches up in, uh, like, the L.A. area are not as pretty as the beaches down in San Diego, definitely not even close, (laughs) but, I mean, just looking at, obviously, the decision, it's an amazing decision, and I'm glad you came over to the States, obviously, to see some of what California's good side has to offer uh, down in San Diego, and obviously, training in Alliance MMA, I mean, I imagine you've trained with the likes of Angela Hill, Jessica Panay, you know, all those amazing names, and just being able to soak up all that knowledge, really, you know, like, from veterans of the sport, that's got to be something remarkable. So kind of just, uh, if you kind of had to narrow it down to one moment, was there any funny moments that stood out to you kind of come from coming to the States that happened in the gym? Such a hard one. Cause honestly, like it was just like nonstop from the day I got there. Like I got there, then I got COVID the next week. And then that was like oh, a whole yikes. thing. Then it was my birthday. And then, um, I was, I went to San Jose, I was meant to commentate and then I ended up testing positive for COVID. So I came back to San Diego and then it was just a whirlwind from there. But I think, um, one of the highlights definitely would be, um, during the time that I was there, we had a lot of the girls sort of come together. Um, and therefore we created this sort of like King Coven, which is fantastic because there is so many, um, high level girls in that area. I mean, there's so many high level, everything in San Diego for sure, like high level jujitsu, um, everything like that. But I was so lucky to kind of be a part of, um, us creating like a woman's team in a sense that we, yeah, ended up calling Team Coven. So, um, the, the likes of Angela Hill, Jessica Penne, um, Jenna Bishop, Alima, um, Brie, the um Kavehi, there's all these girls like unlimited amount of girls that we made and um we all showed up for each other and we kind of really i don't know created this great little bond that we all were on the same page of the destination's all the same for us we all want to get gold so and we all want to get better in our career so that's sort of like our was our big motivator and therefore we had numbers each week and we organize in our group chats to see each other at different gyms and different locations as long as we sort of were together and had each other as training partners that was the best and so sparring sessions like before Angela's last fight getting her ready for that that was amazing to be a part of that and um and help her with some rounds and stuff obviously I'm a lot bigger than her um but just being able to you know give her some sort of striking looks that she couldn't get from the other girls it really made me feel um like I belong and like I was, um, I guess, important, a, a part of the team when you're in Australia and stuff and you're sort of behind the game a little bit. Um, you sort of aren't sure if you're going to really add anything to these UFC fighters and these big names. And then um, being able to get over in there and get in the mix with her um, was awesome and, and I got good feedback. So, so yeah, I think that would definitely be the highlight. It's not really like a specific moment, but just creating that team and having um, those girls. I think I think long term we're all probably we'll always keep in touch, no matter where we are in the world. We'll all be able to, yeah, you know, like have that team to do our camps or whatever if we ever need to. So that was great. 
I mean, that's that's just an amazing answer. I mean, that's better than what I was expecting because <laughs> when, you, when you think about it, like, being able to bring together a group of uh, female fighters to just to come together and be able to constantly be able to drill, you know, hey, meet up at 10 Planet Oceanside. You know, I know Oceanside's down in San Diego. Uh, meet up at 10 Planet Oceanside. Let's get some rolls in, you know, stuff like that. Or come to the gym. Let's get some heavy sparring in, you know, stuff like that. That's just truly, like, being able to have, like, a coherent squad where it's, like, it's like units, bodies, you're being able to kind of all come together and you have this like-minded goal of wanting to progress and become better in the score and medal or even, you know, get some gold around your waist. That's something that's uh, really hard to build in the sport. But I feel like slowly uh, with women's MMA growing and, you know, like especially one of the topics I want to mention is like, you know, Australian and New Zealand, New Zealand women's mixed martial arts. That's been growing majorly in the past couple of years alone. And obviously you mentioned, you know, in Australia, maybe uh, behind a bit, I actually kind of respect, oh, I don't know, I think I disagree a bit, because I think it's getting better, but, um, you know, because you've got the likes of Jenna Fabian from New Zealand, you got Casey O'Neill, you got Jessica Rose Clark, and you got yourself, you know, like, it's slowly coming together, and it's building itself, and I feel like uh, that's something in itself that's remarkable to see the sport, because I know a lot of people kind of talk about um, viewership and whatnot, but I just think, like, in terms of gyms, it's been it's grown so much so that experience and that moment just stood out to me personally you know like it's amazing to see how far the sports come little by little yeah definitely and i mean you can definitely see the australian scene growing i think even like our local show here it was maybe like six months ago had a female featherweight kind of grand prix and, and that in itself is just like leaps and bounds above when i was coming through the rankings people like Aileen, people like jessica rose clark and then you've got all these like kiwis and stuff coming out too we've got michelle montague about to go on the pfl um, I forget what it's called, but it's like that contract sort of con their version of the contender series. Then we've got Nairine over there as well. And then obviously Casey and everything like that. I think like you can kind of see like sort of like the first generation, then the second generation. Now just these girls hitting it, not even just being like motivated by us, but just like completely defying their own journey and making their own decisions to go over to the US or especially during this time during COVID and everything it's been so hard and then you get over to the states and then you see everyone else is over there not just females but I guess guys as well um, like Dan and Kai and all these guys that we all had to like go overseas otherwise we couldn't train because um, Australia and New Zealand just went pretty tight on those restrictions and it was a little bit extreme um, especially for MMA fighters we weren't really recognized as sportsmen the way wow. maybe like our rugby league players and stuff are but um, so we had to make some decisions and I mean it's just great to see it's great to see we have these opportunities now that everyone um, is able to yeah make that sacrifice and it's not out of reach um, because we're all in the mix over there I think there was a little while there where Australia and New Zealand was sort of like its own entity and then um, the American scene was sort of like running on its on its own and now I guess it's all involved and now we've got so many great names coming out of obviously we just watched a phenomenal UFC 271 card with about six Aussie and New Zealand's um, all doing That's really well and performing card. really well. I mean, it's like now we're properly in the mix. You can't deny sort of the Oceana scene um, is like right there at the top. So I think that's definitely helped everything. And for that reason, it's really helped the females as well. So, so seeing not only myself and then seeing someone like Casey who – she went like 0-2 in her first two fights. Like I don't even think a lot of people realize like she I was, was there through all of it. She trained. I trained with her since she was like 13, 14. Um, and obviously that's a young age to start training, you know, like you've got a lot going on as a little teenage kid. And, and I'm just like so proud to watch her persevere and sort of just chase her dreams, sort of follow in my steps a little bit too, like going to Thailand and then and then making her own decisions and defining her own path by going over to Vegas and it really, really paying off. It's just amazing that like I know that what Arlene did, what I did, what Jesse did, um, all these things like have definitely trickled down and, and inspired other girls and, and now we've just got like a phenomenal scene growing over there. No, yeah, most definitely. And it, uh, something that stands out to me, you know, it came into the news a couple of weeks back, you know, with uh, Izzy and Dan Hooker obviously mentioning, uh, you know, New Zealand and Australia don't necessarily recognize the, the I guess, what they've got going for themselves in terms of mixed martial arts with, you know, we've got, you guys got, like, champions. You guys got Israel Adesanya, you got Alexander Volkanovsky, you got two UFC champions as of right now. And uh, to get that kind of treatment, you know, Dan Hooker, like, he, you see the photo of him. Walking out the gym, they hired private investigators just to take photos and close the gym. It's ridiculous. 
And just to see, despite all of these, like, you know, COVID restrictions and, as you mentioned, the chaos in Australia and all the no nonsense that's going on in New Zealand, um, to be able to persevere, maintain your title, get a title, you know, all this all this stuff and seeing the sport evolve. The, like, K the Casey O'Neill story, that in itself is really crazy, you know. Owen 2 as an amateur, comes back 5, I think 6 or 7 and 0 right now as a pro and then... Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, like goes to Thailand, and then from there she's like cornering someone in Abu Dhabi. She takes the charter flight to Las Vegas and doesn't look back since. You know, that's the type of chances I've seen. You know, the Aussie fighters and the New Zealanders being willing to take, and that's the type of stuff that makes mixed makes martial arts the sport that it is. Like the risk taking, all of the pe stuff people sacrifice in order to make it to the top. So to see the the waves that um, you know pioneers like yourself are setting and being able to kind of build and evolve the sport for what it, from what it once was, like you mentioned, in waves is remarkable to me. And something that stands out to me more specifically is the UFC 271 card that, you know, we, were all, we obviously mentioned. That's in itself an insane, an insane milestone. The only thing that bothers me about that card is that it wasn't in Australia or New Zealand. That's the only thing that makes me gutted about the card. Otherwise, yeah. the card was spectacular. You know, you had tons of uh, New Zealanders, you had tons of Australians showing out on that card. Something remarkable to see. And then, obviously, who can forget, you know, Tai Tuivasa, Shuivasa, with the elbow of the ages, you know. Amazing. I think Tai Tuivasa <laughs> might be the catalyst to me learning some Australian slang. Like, uh, I, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Eshes? I don't know. How Eche, do you... yes. You gotta, like, I think if you're, so if you're from different areas in Australia, like, I'm kind of lucky now. I've lived in Sydney. I'm from, Like I said, I grew up on the Gold Coast. Um, I'm back on the Gold Coast now, but... Um, yeah, I got to live in Sydney and, and that, um, that culture is a little bit different. So if you're going to say Esha, you got to like, you got to say it like Ty does, you know, you got to like say it with your chest like Esha, Esha. <laughs> and you got to mean it, you yeah, know, yeah. and then you just got to pretty much speak pig Latin and you're good. You should fit in in the West. Is there like any Australian slang that stands out to you? Like if you had to pinpoint two or three favorite, uh, slang or lingo that stands out to you, what would that be? I think, like, especially spending, like, three months in the U.S., a lot of people were pointing out things that I said that I was like, oh, you guys don't know what that means or you don't understand. Um, heaps is, like, some foreign term to you guys. <laughs> like, we say heaps yeah. of everything. We're like, um, there's heaps of food at home or something like that. Heaps just obviously means a lot of, but we use it in a lot of contexts. And then therefore we also say the word keen and not a lot of people keen. like, no, it's like, yeah, like British, like, it's oh, kind of like British. Like, like, yeah, keen. And then everyone's like, what? Like if you're in America, people don't quite understand. So you can join those two things together and say that you're heaps keen to do stuff. And that's definitely, I think a staple. If you're on the West, like tie in that, um, you got to say itwa. That means obviously it's like a pig Latin for sweet. So if you're doing like when we say sweet a lot, pretty much for everything, yeah, that's sweet, or yeah, we're sweet, or whatever. So you got to say like you're sweet, or you got to say that you're doing itwa. Um, that kind of thing. I think those two would be probably the best. Heaps keen and itwa. <laughs> Heaps keen and itwa. Heaps and keen. I, I mean, in our language. In our like, on our English, like I know we use those, but heaps keen I would never think would go together as like oh, one cohesive yeah. statement. And Fortnite, you guys don't use the word Fortnite. I don't know if you remember that going off on my Instagram for a hot minute there, but my old roommate, I was just having a conversation with him, and then I was like, oh yeah, because I get paid every Fortnite, and he was like, what? The video game. And I was like, <laughs> Fortnite. I was like, I was like, oh, you don't use that word. He's like, I don't know what that means. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know what that means? And then went through the whole house, asked the Lima, asked her husband Jason. I was like, okay, you guys don't know what it means. Then took to Instagram, blah blah blah. So Fortnite, fourteen nights, fortnightly. It's every two weeks. That's the word. It's not bi-weekly, guys. That's not the correct. Use. Fortnite is every Fortnite. two weeks. Noted, noted, noted. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even slang. That's just like proper English. That's just proper. I mean, yeah. I mean, the U.S. kind of got some weird English, English grammatical decisions. I gotta, I gotta point it out there. Definitely one of the, <laughs> heaps and keen are definitely gonna be my vocabulary. You know, heaps keen, heaps yeah. keen, heaps keen, one hundred percent. I had and, Sean Shelby saying that for like uh, months, months. And then, and then you gotta say from the chest, Eshays, Eshays. Yeah. 
Lad, you can kind of say and that. If you I think want. that's like an eighty. That term originated in the eighties, right? I was looking it up. I think it's like an old term that <laughs> the party. It's like in the party scene, right? Know. Like a youth thing or something. Probably, and then the West just like took it and it sent. <laughs> Definitely. Got sent. There's a lot of like because um, our Australian rap scene, I think, influences mm-hmm. a lot of that. Uh, yeah, like slang and stuff like that and a lot of the culture out there so there's a lot of itswa there's a lot of like yeah like pig latin and then hectic i think hectic would be the other one that i kept saying it over in the u.s I, like I, someone yeah. saying i'm like hectic like that's like it's that's insane it, yeah that's a lot like an emphasis on whatever it was um and then they'd be like why do you keep saying that <laughs> like because it's hectic that's why because <laughs> <laughs> the law um honestly like I don't know, hectic <laughs> Hectic is, like, a bit of an interesting term. Like, I use hectic as, like, madness, like, insane. But I don't even know if that's correct. True. That's kind of just how I came it's up. It's not necessarily chaos. It's more like, oh, that's really good. Like, oh, cool. Like, that's like, awesome. That's hectic. You can say it in different ways, too. You could be, like, if something was somewhat negative, you'd be, like, like you can kind of be, I guess, facetious and, or, like, some, somewhat sarcastic and be, like, hectic, like. And it's not, you know, or but if it's somewhat positive, then you can emphasize that and be like, that's hectic. <laughs> no, I definitely noted. I'm, I'm glad to have had this uh, Australian I feel like this is a really important conversation. It, it, it's have, an you know? incredibly important, you know, you, you don't understand. This is this is the contribution to society that I'm going to be making to the Australian and New Zealand community, you know, through this. This show. is going to help me communicate more with my American friends. So I feel like it's all. 100 percent it's an equal trade it's an equal trade but i mean (laughs) it's amazing it's just amazing because um we see you know this like evolution or not evolution but more so the significance with just the vocabulary like you see taito ivasa uh obviously donning the aboriginals flag if i'm not mistaken you know you're seeing all this like indigenous culture and all these like um oceanic you know uh terminology all this stuff coming together i think it's very important for us you know uh, not to be ignorant or anything and just understand, you know, the different terminologies, the applications of them. So for me, this is like amazing in a sense. Yeah, I think it's even insane that something like a shoey can take off mm-hmm. like all across. Like it, what you're seeing like Laura Sanka, Lauren Sanka and like that kind of thing doing shoeys. Like I would like shoeys are somewhat big over here, but I don't know if like everyone does them. And then Ty just took that whole part of the culture and it like took off. And I think that's amazing that um, America and the rest of the world really embraced, um, I guess just Ty for his genuine personality and stuff. And I think just because he is who he is, and I think he's like one of the funniest people I've ever met and he's genuinely himself that translated really well and therefore like they took up so many things that he does and I think like the shoey was just so cool for him to have like a very staple and recognizable thing that um kind of fits and is very on brand for him so um it's really cool just seeing like the rest of the world embrace us and and just little things that are happening and then all of those guys Alex and Izzy and all those and Rob and everyone that deserves to sort of be I guess notice more than just like they're fighting and and it's sort of taken off. So I think that's like been great for MMA and then great for the Anzacs and therefore um, yeah, hopefully our culture sort of spreads a little bit more. Like maybe not just shoeys because you know like I'm not gonna do a shoey anytime no, soon, not but every time, just right. like the the lingo and just understanding us is cool. The sober shoey, I gotta do the sober shoey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or if I, if someone gives me like a glass slipper or something, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. But something that um. You know, it stands out to me. Even you mentioned like bringing that em- emphasis on bringing that part of the culture over. I think something that stands out to me is uh, I don't know if you remember. Uh, I think it was Shane Young versus Ludovic Klein. He was doing the haka, uh, which is like a war cry. I think if I'm not mistaken, or like a war, uh, t- not like a taunt, but necessarily like uh, kind of like a. I don't know. I don't want to be like incorrect here, but it's kind of like this yeah. uh, say it from your chest type thing where it's showing like we're ready to go in and do whatever it is we need to do. And I think, like, stuff like that, that's being able to come over and translate into modern sports is something that's beautiful in this day and age because we don't necessarily, I think, in nowadays, people are really scared to show off their culture. And especially with the amount of, you know, indig- indig- indigenous fighters, sorry, like, that word is... It's getting you. It's getting there. <laughs> Indigenous fighters that are coming. You know, we've got uh, Frank Camacho, who's one of my good friends from Guam. 
We've got, you know, the uh, obviously the Hawaiians. We've got, you know, the, the people from New Zealand who are Maori, if I'm not mistaken. And then we've got the Aboriginals and all these other beautiful indigenous groups coming and showing their culture. That's just something that's more, so, sometimes that's more important to me than the fight itself because it's opening up new barriers. And although it's not a shui, it's something that stands out beyond just a shui. If you're able to bring your culture and show the significance of it, then that's even more re remarkable to me in a sense. Yeah, even um, I went to a card in Singapore, must have been maybe like 2018, I'm thinking, and Shane Young um, fought and then he um, did his whole post-fight, well, not his whole, but he, he did like a, a long post-fight kind of speech in Te Rio Māori, which is um, phenomenal. And I just remember like gave me goosebumps. It was just like insane, like we're in the middle of Asia and this little Māori boy is like speaking to you on international television and representing our culture. And I think it's a really big testament to all the guys that are in the UFC or in have these big platforms are not only like fighting and winning and, and getting their paycheck and leaving, but they're representing their own cultures individually as much as they can because they're so prideful of them. Like you said, like doing the haka. Haka is, I think, like pretty internationally recognized now um, as one of our traditional sort of uh, routine things and and you can, you don't just have to use it as a war cry you can do it at weddings you can you know like there's there's all sort of different hackers that represent different sort of uh, vibes I guess but just being able to see that and being able to know that the the rest of the world recognizes it and then someone say like Jason Momoa doing it at the like Aquaman um, premiere and stuff like that it's just like seeing your own culture like on the big stage front especially being from such a small country that has like five million population and um and then the world's like sort of recognizing it i think that's amazing and then again a big testament to these guys so it's really cool that the rest of the world is embracing it but then uh, above and beyond that the boys that are out there representing their own cultures are doing it um to a t and, and really like i guess paying a lot of respect to it no yeah just amazing like that's that's what we need more of that in this sport let's be real like we need more we just need more uh, genuine. We just need more genuine vibes, I think, and that's what you guys are providing to us. So for that, I think like the fans should be eternally grateful for that, where you're getting this genuine uh, cultural atmosphere and like aspects that you wouldn't normally get with uh, you know traditional American sports. So from that aspect, it shows how international the sports gotten, and for that, I I yeah. think we we can't be more grateful than what we are now. I just think that's yeah like it's amazing it's amazing way more multicultural too way yeah because we have that individual aspect we literally have people from all over the world and it's great to see like when you look at all the champions and even like the past champions they're all like multicultural brazilian russian like whatever kyrgyzstan dagestan like there's so many like cool different cultures getting represented and then like no like having izzy um francis nagano and um Kamaro. Usman, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's like amazing. And then, yeah, obviously, then having the Robs and the Alexes and the past, like, it's just cool. Like, and then having someone even like Figueredo and um, Brandon Moreno, like that international clash three times and stuff like that. You just, you're not getting like a cookie cutter thing, and everyone gets to represent their own part of the world, and we all get to come together and sort of uh, compete in this like one sport that we all love equally. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, most definitely. And just to kind of, uh, Obviously, you mentioned that quite a bit. Just to kind of go into your personal goals, something that uh, really interests me. Obviously, the Bellator 145 landscape, in my opinion, it's much better than the UFC's 145 landscape. Because, you know, who's like not even a knock on the fighter. There's nobody in the division. But Bellator has basically built itself this amazing 145 division. You know, you've got yourself. You've got Liam McCourt. You've got, I, I think, Chris Cyborg at the top. You've got uh, Arlene Blanco, you've got Sinead Kavanaugh, you've got all these big names and you've fought like half of them and being able to kind of um, see how far the division has become in Bellator. I feel like it's one of the, the hidden gems of the promotion if you're being, if you're being completely honest. Uh, how do you see like the land, like do you, how do you feel like the Bellator landscape plays out over the next year or so or where do you kind of picture yourself in that picture? Obviously uh, the division's right for the taking. I think anybody can really come in at any point and basically insert themselves in position for the title shot. Uh, kind of, you mentioned obviously recovery. You're hoping to fight in the next couple of months. Where do you kind of uh, see yourself in this Bellator uh, 145 pound division, and how do you feel like uh, you would fare against the people you haven't faced yet? Yeah, I mean it's super exciting. When I got signed 
I feel like it was sort of at the beginning of this whole featherweight come up and then um, you could sort of see the UFC try to catch up in a sense and then um, PFL coming through with their lightweight division. Yeah, I don't think any other uh, promotion can sort of uh, hold the same standard of female featherweights that um, we do have in Bellator, which is definitely obviously a big motivator as to why I'm there and why I've been there for the last um, four or five years. So I think um, it's just super exciting. Like I, I think uh, when I got signed, I was definitely, I definitely feel like I was learning a lot on the job. I was probably like one of the least experienced. Um, and now I've had six fights with them under my belt. Um, I think, uh, yeah, everything's going to change for me in the next couple of years. It's, it's definitely, I'm moving into like a more mature version of myself as an athlete. And I think that's going to be exciting for, um, my next few fights, especially like you said, I've fought a lot of those girls in the top 10. So, um, looking towards the title, looking definitely towards the, the higher end of the top five. Um, it's going to be one, there's some really exciting matchups and two, um, I'm going to be taking that belt within the next year or so. It just obviously depends on this eye and that's kind of, I'm not really too stressed out about that in a sense. If, if it takes a little bit longer, it takes a little bit longer, but again, like I'm the youngest in the top 10. So, um, I'm glad that I've sort of made, I guess my mistakes earlier on in a sense and, and I've learned everything and I matured not only as an athlete but as a person so I'm really ready to take on um, these like this kind of like the takeover I guess like um, hopefully I get another win in uh, April um, I'm not really sure who um, and then obviously there's just like a lot of exciting matchups that are either rematches or one of those top three like you're saying like Chris Cyborg obviously everyone's always looking to the title I'm looking forward to that maybe I'd say like maybe another like in the next three fights I would probably see a matchup with her because obviously she's ru- kind of running out of title challenges as well so that sort of puts you in a position and then as well as that there's people like Kat Zingano, Leslie Smith um then a, a rematch against Sinead would be great a rematch against Leah would be great those kind of things so um I think there's all exciting stuff it, it's it's definitely going to define itself a little bit more in the next couple of years I think and then therefore um I think it like once I have the title it'll just sort of change things um I like I'll push not only the division and and women's MMA, but I think um, our side of the world as well. I can't wait to sort of like bring the belt back to Australia and hopefully have a Bellator in Australia or in New Zealand, but uh, most likely be Australia and and, and do cool stuff with that. And I think like you're saying, it is sort of like the the underdog of uh, like feature of Bellator. And um, so when I do get the belt, I think I'll I'll definitely make that known. Most definitely. And obviously an amazing, an amazing division. It's hopefully, you know, we've got years to come with the division seeing how the division is going to progress is going to be real interesting in the next couple of months. I think that's the case for a lot of Bellator's divisions right now. They're slowly, you know, um, I think people like to compare them to the UFC and PFL. I just don't think that's a valid comparison. I think they're all their own individual entities. So just seeing Bellator's division become what it is for what it is, is something that's amazing to see. And hopefully, you know, God willing, uh, we'll see you with that, you know, gold, gold belt strapped around your waist, bringing it back to Australia and, is there like any final thoughts, Janae, for the fans at home who may not know who you are or to your Australian peeps or your New Zealand peeps? Like, is there any final message you kind of have for those people watching you from home? Um, not really. I think the guys that have watched me sort of remember me for a little while just because like win, lose or draw, um, always bring on a show and I'm excited to keep doing that. But with a little bit more calculation now and a, a lot of my skill sets are sort of settling. So um, and then obviously all these sacrifices that I made over the last year going overseas to San Diego, all that stuff's paid off. And now going through a little bit of adversity has definitely lit a spark inside me and a little bit more hunger so the fire is kind of burning and i'm excited to show it off in the, these next couple of performances maybe less vision for sure but still the same goal and, and i can't wait to sort of uh achieve it all and and really help um i guess leave a little bit more of a legacy most definitely and thank you so much janae for your time it's been an honor to speak to you i am heaps keen to watch your next fight did i say that correctly it's uh yes yes that's you it. love to hectic. see it you love to see it Heaps <laughs> ke- hectic heck i forgot that one all right noted so thank you so much janae for your time obviously it's been amazing speaking to you and learning all this aussie lingo and sl- and slang to say definitely gonna be heaps keen to watch your next fight all the aussies all the new zealanders you know the vibes 
Uh, I'm going to link Janae's uh, social medias in the description down below. Uh, if you guys want to go, I think you have, there was something mentioned about sponsors or if you were, if sponsors were looking to like sponsor you or anything, if you guys are wanting to sponsor Janae or anything, just, uh, I feel DM her or whatnot, you know, I think uh, something can be worked out. Obviously, I'm going to link her socials down in the description. Thank you guys for watching the MMA cast. This has been Dan for Dapper Media. I'm heaps keen to the next episode. Sliding out, guys. See you, see you, see you. Have a great rest of your day.